This is the exciting story of the rediscovery and exploration of the cave found on top of Mount Kanaktai. According to old Indian legends, the Indians who have lived around the shores of beautiful Clear Lake at the base of Mount Kanaktai for over 12,500 years. This is a most sacred mountain. Legends tell of a cave at Horseshoe Bend that starts at the cliff on the shore and goes into the mountain. Indians walked into the cave and held religious ceremonies. Legend also says they buried their dead in this cave. When the water rose in the lake, they would paddle their reed boats up a short distance and caught blind fish. Another legend tells of the little people that lived inside the mountain during the cold times. Another tells that the Indians could notch sticks and throw them down a hole in the top of the mountain. They would find them floating in Horseshoe Bend. All this was long before the white man came. About 1880, a white hunting party stumbled on the cave on top of the mountain. They climbed down into the entrance and found a hole in the floor of the cave. In trying to measure the depth of the hole, they used long weighted strings up to 1,100 feet, but found no bottom. They dropped a bundle of burlap soaked in kerosene and lighted, and it disappeared straight down. Many people have visited the site in the last 90 years. Sometime between 1940 and 1970, the cave collapsed about 15 feet from the entrance, and the vertical shaft has not been seen since. In 1990, a couple of hikers rediscovered the cave, which had been lost in the heavy underbrush for several years, and reported the find. An exploration team was formed to reopen the cave and find and measure the vertical lava vent. In our investigation of the cave and the circumstances around it, we believe it will, we will find a very large room where the molten lava drained from the inside of the mountain and possibly a lake from where the legendary blind fish could have come. a picture of what I vision the inside of the mountain to look like. Uh, this is the main room that uh, I expect to find. 2,000 feet from this point over to this point and somewhere between 2,400 and 2,600 feet to this point with a lake in the bottom somewhere around 90 feet deep. There are other openings on the mountain that <clears throat> Indian legend tell us about and other old timers in the area that I've talked to. This is what you're seeing is a summary of the all of the stories and evidence that I have collected over a period of about 34 years. Over here is an entrance in the uh, Black Forest, Buckingham area, another one up at this point, which the Indians called the Ice Cave, supposedly went in about 300 feet and then on down into a room down below, the main room. This one over here was the Hummel Cave, which he, uh, by the name of Ron Hummel, and two other or three other boys carved their name in a log and threw them down this and went down into the lake and came out through the underground stream here over into Horseshoe Bend. Another one over on South Peak. Another story by the well, lady in the Girl Scouts about 50 years ago on Clark's Peak, which is behind this. And they threw some cans that were sealed and painted down through a hole uh, in the in Clark's Peak, which also went down in, came into the lake, out through the underground stream over into Horseshoe Bend. <clears throat> now, according to Indian legend and the stories of the little people that lived inside the mountain during the cold time, this is where I believe we're going to find some <clears throat> artifacts of an ancient civilization in this area, possibly over in this area also, but mainly in this area, because we believe there's a <clears throat> underground or a tunnel that comes over into this area. And I've labeled a spider here because in this area we found, just to the left of this area, we found a spider, a uh, pictogram.
photograph carved into the ground at the end of a long Indian trail, and I'll show that to you here in a few minutes. But we have evidence that the lake is inside, according to the Indians, the blind fish, and that in the old days when the lake down here was <clears throat> nothing but a series of streams, why they could walk <clears throat> up into this cave a short distance. They had ceremonies and they buried their dead and so forth. And when the lake rose, they could paddle their canoes up in here a short distance. <clears throat> they found blind fish and etc. Now, in this area here, uh, we have a, there was a trailer park called <clears throat> Shady Haven. And the man drilled a well for his uh, mobile home park. And at about 75 feet, he broke into a, an artesian well sort of thing. The water spurted out through the casing at about 50 feet in the air. Now, he put valves on it, and to this day, after a good rain and the lake inside is full, this well will, when he opens the uh, valve, will shoot water about 30 feet. And as soon as I uh, finish with this particular picture, I'll show you some other areas where I think the water is com comes out of the side of the mountain. When this lake level rises higher and the ability of this underground stream is not capable of taking the entire amount of water that's inside. Now we're working in a vent up at the top here. We've been here almost four years now. <clears throat> and I think we're about to break in very soon. But once we do, we will take a measuring line and measure from there down to the bottom. See how deep it is. Make sure that we are able to take samples of the water from the bottom, sample the air. We'll also lower a <clears throat> camera with lights and take as much uh, evidence as we can, sh show what the inside of the room looks like. Once we're sure that it's safe, we're going to lower men down in probably with a rubber boat, radios, and uh, other <clears throat> equipment to make sure that they're safe. They may have to stay down here up to a week and watch and look for <clears throat> all these other areas. Come out in here, find this cave, look for the entrance to this one as well as possible. Explore as much as they can before they come back up. Now this is what we intend to do, <clears throat> and the lake itself, I'm positive, is in there due to all the other evidence. Now this is the east side of uh, Mount Kanakdai. What you're looking at is Wright's Peak, where the top of the where the uh, Howard Cave is. If you little see the little streak on the side of the mountain, just about center for height and just slightly to the left there was a water spout came out of that in 1964 and that when the lake evidently was very full now this is the southeast side of the mountain and you'll see also a streak right in that area where <clears throat> when the mountain is uh or the lake gets full up to a certain point, the water will come out of the side of the mountain at that point. Now I'm going to come up closer and you can see this is where the water seeps out of the side of the mountain. This is about 350 feet above lake level and this is why I say the lake inside is somewhere between 300 and 400 feet above the level of Clear Lake. We have a aerial map from about uh, 15,000 feet of the Kanaktai Bay area, the uh, southeast side of 
of Mount Kanakai. And here we see what we did now is the Bayshore uh, Marina. This is Soda Bay Road. On up, up the hill to Lakeview Drive. Lakeview Drive out this way. Of course, this is Soda Bay Road going over toward Highway 29. On zooming in to the area, we find an old Indian trail, very old, comes in, follow my pointer here, comes on down, around, Following the pen here, the pointer coming on across. This is an aerial view of the spot where the uh, spider was found on the southeast slope of Mount Kanaktai, right where you see the end of the houses there, just about uh, dead center in the picture, is where we found the Indian pictograph of the spider. And in that area, we know that there are large lava caverns down under, underneath the surface. And without a doubt, the entrance into those is in this particular area. I doubt if we'll find it because of cave-ins, landslides, and so forth over the thousands of years. But the spider we did find, and it is still there. And 
another view of the area. You can see the houses. This is Fairway Drive. And it's on the southeast side of Mount Kanaktai. And somewhere in that area, possibly, we will find the entrance to a tunnel that goes inside of the mountain. Here, between these two houses at the foot of the arrow, is where we found the spider. And it is still, after, still there after all these thousands of years. Isn't that rather amazing? However, I, as I said before, I don't expect that we will find the entrance to the cave in that area. However, we may find it from the inside. Now, once more, to tell you where the spider is, if you can see the white houses on the left side of the picture in that group of homes, the ones furthest to the right at the very, uh, almost the center of the picture that is up and down, uh, about the center, that's where the spider is located. And you can see it, its position with the mountain. And now I would like to take you up to the top of Wright's Peak and show you how we started in to the cave, the Howard Cave, and began our exploration of the mountain. our first day on the mountain and here we are at a locked gate. Now we did not have the key we, to get through the gate at this time. So as you can see here's what we had to do. We had to pack up. We took our shovels, our picks, our buckets, ropes, food, water, had to walk three miles up to the cave entrance. Three miles with a 50-pound pack and all our goodies. see the brush down into the area was extremely thick and here we are at the site we've already set up our ropes and our safety equipment so that we can get in and out Preston Stevens who is one of the hikers that uh, first found the uh, cave, reported to me, and we formed a team, and now you see Norm Lerman, chief geologist for the Homestake Mining Corporation, a renowned volcanologist, and our number one advisor on the team. He's going down into 16 and a half feet down into the entrance as we first found it, and he has to turn and go sideways to a very small crevice about 15 feet down into the main cavern. And now we're down inside. Show you what it looked like as we first got in. Now we're showing the insignia on the wall, the name is carved into the wall. There's Ewell Howard, dated 1934. And below it, uh, R. Reed, 1931. And this was our main authentication that we were in the right cave. Now you see Norm down inside, and he's taking down dimensions, trying to figure out 
uh, just exactly how we ought to attack the cave here and find through the cave in and get back into where the main vertical lava tube is. We really expected to come down in here, clean this out in about three hours and find our vertical shaft. But four years later, we still haven't quite made it. Good picture of Norm. Uh, this was our first day. And here's what we're having to do here. Get down in. We have to remove the dirt. We just barely get into some of these places. We pull the dirt back, fill it in a bucket, and then it has to be carried up to the entrance and lifted 16 and a half feet and then dumped. setting fire to a little piece of paper, one of our lunch bags, put the fire out, get smoke, and the cave is drawing in air very strongly, and we make smoke and try to follow where the smoke goes to see if we can follow the old cave path down through the cave in and know just which way to dig. Norm, again back at the entrance. We still don't have any electric power up there, so Norm is taking a couple extra flashlights down. And another smoke test. See, it's being drawn quite rapidly right into the crevice. And, of course, this is me coming out from one of the crevices. promised my wife faithfully I'd never do this, but I just couldn't couldn't hold out. I had to get down in with the crew. Pointing out some of the uh, other initials in the wall, that's Blevins, 1931. Above it would be R. Reed. Another BG, 1980, but of course when he went down it was caved in. And I'm a pretty large fellow, 6'3", 220, and uh, I'm trying to get out through this little narrow entrance. time there I was kind of wondering. Luckily I had somebody in front of me and a couple behind me, some to push and some to pull. Now here Norm is going to do a magnetometer test. going to try to find, see if we can time, find the top of the vent and maybe intercept after the cave in and find our room where the uh, top of the vent is, save ourselves a lot of work, but it just did not work out.
getting magnetometer readings. The last time that Norm and his wife came up here, when they ran these, this was the area that they found to be the closest to where the vent might actually be. That little pile of rocks. So go ahead and do some more magnetometer readings while we're up here. Here's the equipment line here. And hopefully, get a better idea on how to reach this thing. And this is Norm doing the rest of the figures. I'm going to make drawings. See if we can find out what we're trying to do here is see if we can't intercept the cave beyond the cave in. Then we took the results of the magnetic survey, drew it out, and you can see the lines of uh, force with the blue and then the spot in the center where we had the best reading, which showed us just about where we figured the top of the vent would be. And what we're trying to do now is get somewhere between the cave-in and the actual entrance to the little room where the uh, uh, top of the vent was. It's up, and of course the darker part of the blue is where we got the best reading. So we started to dig a trench. You can see the outline of the trench there where we're going to try to intercept beyond the cave-in of the, of the Howard Cave. And find our way into the top of the lava, vertical lava tube. And here is trench number one. We've been working on it now about uh, oh, a month and a half, two months. And we're down about nine and a half feet. And we're back in about 18 feet. at the very back of the uh, trench and we're getting some very strong uh, indications of air being pulled in so Norm is about to do a smoke test here he measured the uh, crack uh, for depth uh, it goes back in about 36 inches now he's lighting a cigar he doesn't smoke. <laughs> so this is what we're doing. We have a turkey baster, and we suck it full of smoke, and then we poke it and take a look at what, what that smoke is doing. Very strongly sucking it right down into that crack. same time we're working on trench number one we have a crew working inside the cave and we're still trying to see where if 
we can possibly dig through the cave in. We've got two crews, one outside trench number one, one inside inside the cave. And we're finding little crevices down there, and the air goes on down. on the bottom and we're searching for the cave about a hundred about 200 feet out uh, here in Horseshoe Bend there are my divers you can see the bubbles coming up they're evidently going round and round the boat here they just a few minutes ago reported a, a hole in the bottom where a lot of algae, and I guess they're looking for it right at the present time. They're anchored down at the bottom. We have decided to take some time off from the mountain and see if we can't find out where the cave in Horseshoe Bend could be. And there are two divers down on the bottom, Norm Lerman and Preston Stevens. And we had reports that the cave was about 200 feet out from this building we're looking at right at the present time. So we have them on the bottom. This buoy and about 150 yards south to where we have this, where is it? That's where we are at the present time. And we're supposed to be straight out from Split Rock. And see if we can find Split Rock. There's, there is Split Rock right there. This is another one of the stories that we were told when the old timers came out and told us that uh, just where we would find the underground cave. And of course we spent almost about four days just round and round out here. However, we did find some other things. We decided to go out onto the lake further and investigate gas hole 18. And there you can see the uh, bubbles erupting out to gas hole 18. This thing er erupts about every six and a half minutes. We spent quite some time and we dove to the bottom of it. We found out that the bottom of the lake is 42 feet. And then that gas hole there goes down another 72 feet for a total of 112 feet below the surface. And our divers went to the bottom, got the measurements, how wildly it's erupting there. Starting to taper off a little bit. There are divers have just come up from the bottom. And just finished there doing their measurements. And here we are on the bottom of the gas hole, and look what we found. Millions of little catfish, baby catfish, all swimming around just at the inside the uh, gas hole, right at the entrance. 
you could reach in and, like they did and grab a whole handful of these, just thousands of them. The visibility at the bottom is very limited pretty muddy, mucky, and we're using uh, underwater lights and a camera, but uh, can't really see much. Mainly what we found was by feel. Meanwhile, <clears throat> back in the cave, Kelly Fremming has found another crevice down in there. She's uncovered. And we're going to measure it, and we're going to try and poke the camera down in. Drilled and jackhammered this, uh, these rocks apart so that we can send, poke the camera down in, make a, make a room enough to, uh, it's still too small for us to get down in, but we can put the camera down in. There it goes. And we think we found the other side of the cave. Looks like a big room. Awesome artifacts. And you just saw one there. It looked like an old Indian bowl. However, we got back out of there and dug in so we could get in. We found out that the camera had, by being so close and focusing, made it look like these were big boulders down here when in reality they were very small and the camera just kind of exaggerated everything. There. I'll freeze it for a second. You can see the round thing over on the left side. That was a acorn cap. New team member, geologist, Kelseyville science teacher, Angie Hello. Hello. <laughs> what we're doing today is uh, just taking the, the main entry chamber down a little bit. You can see Angie's down in the area that Preston and Kelly dug out on the last session, and uh, we're just lowering the whole floor of the material that's filled in, encountering a lot of roots there, She's cutting some of those things out of the way now. Uh, we've had my dad, Frank Lehrman, up on the bucket line today, hauling stuff out of the hole, and we're also equipped again with uh, headset radios that we can communicate to the surface with very well. But we've taken this down about a foot today. We'll, uh, we'll give you another shot here in a little bit. All right, you're seeing Lyle Stockwell back down in the cave. You can also notice the flow of uh, dust and air past the light coming down towards me. It's an inward flow again today. We've been just taking down the apron of material that washed in from the entry area. The camera right now is back in the deep crack that uh, was opened up in last week's digging. Okay, we're looking up towards the entry. You see Lyle here in the foreground. We've taken this uh, lower part of the fan down a good three feet. And up above you see Angie applying another coat of uh, latex molding material to the Uvell Howard signature. We're trying to build up a, a good thick rubber mold on that that we can peel off in a few days so that we can make some castings of the inscriptions on the wall. Jim Whitlock came up 
peeling the latex mold material off of the Uvell Howard inscription. We've painted on about 10 coats, covered it with a layer of gauze. And this will allow us to make museum quality mold castings of the inscription. You're just about to come to the signature there, Alan, so take it real gently at that central part. We just lost our light. Okay, we're recording. Okay, we're back on the air again. Here comes the mold. You can start to see the reverse image of Uvell's signature there. See the 34. And don't let the surfaces touch on that, Alan. They'll stick together like so we dust them. All right, looks like we got a good peel. There you see the reverse image. Uvell Howard's inscription, cast in latex. Here we are, back in trench number one. And we got the husky fellows using the big jackhammer, breaking up rocks. And this is Nelson Hopper, the shaman or medicine man for the Eastern Pomo Indian Band. And he has come up here to bless our mountain for us, the spirits of the mountain. in the cave. Norm has found a little tiny crevice and he's in the process of sticking a uh, measuring tape down in. Okay, now you said about 10 feet first time. Still going.
Now, this little crevice is the one that uh, Norm just measured. And he stuck the tape in 25 feet. However, it did bend over. And this is the beginning of Savior's Hole. What we call Savior's Hole. We're getting a little bigger now. Now we've dug the hole out so that we can get inside and take a look. And it is a clear hole, no dirt. And this is looking from the inside out. And inside is a fellow by the name of Savior. And he was the only one small enough to get in that hole. At the time, we poked him in there, and then he took the measurements and called it Xavier's Hole. That's Xavier right there. Norm Learman are down. There's Norm just peeking through. Yeah, hi, Leroy. feet away. I'm zoomed in on them down through that little bitty hole. And you can bet your sweet. Leroy. Leroy coming out of the hole now. You can see he's pretty tight squeeze. Yeah, I got it. We'll make it eventually. I guarantee you, I'd have never got down there. I'd have to go back and take all the nickels out of my pocket. <laughs> Maybe he can push your feet. <laughs> yeah, I'm there. Well, I'll shut this thing off for a minute and get out of Leroy's way. Okay, go ahead. Okay. All right. right. You're on. Okay, we're here today with Leroy Thomas. Kelseyville, Leroy may very well be the last living person that's been all the way through this chamber to the hole that we're looking for. So uh, thought we'd get Leroy here today and, and kind of record the story for history. When was it you were here, Leroy? Somewhere between 37 and 38, along in that period. Uh, it was after I was in high school, probably a freshman or sophomore, and I think uh, I graduated from high school in 41. So, in the late 30s. Yeah, it'd be in the late 30s. Mm -hmm. And do you remember this entry pretty much? This pretty much the just, same. Yeah. Just to, do you remember this, this entry squeeze being pretty much like we see behind us here? Right. right? Mm -hmm. you come into this room. The, these uh, initials were already on the wall. Because it was after 34, here's a 31. Uh, I can remember those. Uh, uh, I especially remember Howard there. Uh, so no doubt it, this is the right case. To my recollection, this is. This is the one that everybody that, that knows the mountain talks about. And, and, and this is the one where you saw the hole right, going on down. Right, right. And uh, so you remember this chamber pretty much like we see it right now, huh? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then, I don't think it's changed much. And then what What? What was it like beyond this point? Well, as I, as my memory serves me right. It continued on. Just about where Bob's standing with the with the uh, recorder, and went down 25 percent, whatever you know. It's it pretty much the same graduation as, as we're sitting here, mm -hmm. and then went through a real small opening as I crawled through head first, right where Bob is, or further For, in, a little further in than where Bob is, a little further behind him there, and uh, and then I 
can't remember how far through that hole that, that, that I went till the hole went straight down. And then we just dropped rocks and tried to listen to see if we could hear them hit. That's about it. Now that, that tight segment was a, a short way or, or you crawled quite a ways with it? Uh, I would say not over three or four feet. Mm -hmm. yeah. And maybe not even that far. And, but, and the but big hole was right beyond that? Beyond it that. Opened up it opened up a little bit and then, then, then the hole went straight down. Yeah. Now, were you able to crawl on your hands and knees or was this pretty much a belly crawl? A I belly crawl through the hole and, and, and I'm not sure whether I was scared enough that I didn't get get that you know, sit upright or whether I just stayed there and, and, and dropped rocks in, you know, mm -hmm. because at, at, at that age you thought any minute the whole thing was going to cave in on you, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and, well, would it be fair to think, you know, I've thought about that side of it, the kind of the emotional side, mm -hmm. and it seems to me if it had been a long way, if it had been 50 feet, you'd probably remember that. Yeah. Wouldn't you? I don't remember it being that far. I don't remember it being that far. So you guess, uh, Right now we can see down there a total of, say, 25 feet from the entrance or so. you think it was probably a little further than where we can see? I think it was, yes. I think it was. Uh, maybe another, could it be another 10 feet? Uh, I don't think it, I, I don't think it'd be another 20 feet. Yeah. If yeah. my memory serves me right. Now. Right in the hole itself. Yeah, yeah. And it went straight down. It went straight down. And what was it like, as you remember it? Uh, was it a little crack or was it a round? No, hole? it was. Yeah, and basically you heard about this case from the Howard, yeah, from Howard. Mm -hmm. and 
he never mentioned any other case. So chances are this was the one that he knew So about. and this has got to be the one you were in and you saw the hole. Yep. And you threw rocks down it. Yeah. And dropped them. This is apparently the case that the Howard knew death, not exclusively, and uh, by inference then this is probably the case that Coley Cole was in and where the gunny sacks were dropped and all that story. Back in the cave, we're doing some smoke tests here. We're at the far end now. We've moved forward about another 10 feet. And we're... Let's try some of these others. All righty. Yeah, good breeze, good. Strong suction going in there. Uh, Nothing much I happening really there. Down below, it, there's some cracks. Um, Notice the smoke is just sitting here. It really yeah. isn't going much for us. Not much happening on this heading. It looks yeah. like off to the right here is still our best, our best focus. That one isn't drawing. This one is. Yep. So I think we got a heading. I think we're, yeah. I was kind of hit. I'm standing over, right overhead here, uh, hole right here. And there's that main rock. There's the bifurcating rock just a little bit ahead. Actually, I think we removed it. That's just a, an erratic right there. We just haven't taken out yet. But anyway, the one right down here is the one that's uh, always been there. Looking up above, you can see we've all those rocks that were pinned in between. And you see we made extensive uh, dig down deep. Now we're going to go in a little bit more. Uh, we're <coughs> having problems here. We're so far into the cave now, it's taken up to 12 people on buckets to get all the dirt out. So now we're looking for a place, and we're going to see if we can't possibly drill through from the top. And here we are starting to drill down, see if we can't break into the top of the cave. Got an eight foot drill bit here. And we're trying to see if we can break into the top of the cave so we can start a new entrance. Wild Stockwell coming out. Wants to be out of there just in case anything happens here. We're drilling from the top now, a lot of vibration. We've got to shore it up as much as we can. Oh, we're dirt is falling through right straight ahead. At the right hand corner of our workings, this is the head wall. That dirt is falling through the drill hole. And now we've dug a trench and we've opened up the bottom end of the cave. 
So now we can come in from both ends. We have now gone through our entrance, we, and we've lowered the floor by another 10 feet, and we're into a, an area now that is very, very unstable. And if we move any more rocks now, the entire wall and ceiling will come down. As you can see, we've got it shored up as best we can. We're looking up now toward the original entrance, which goes up another, it's about 18 feet above us at this time. You can see some of the shoring. <clears throat> and right now we're looking at what was the old cave floor. There are acorns and uh, pine cones, uh, rat droppings, uh, so forth old leaves, and we've gone through this little crevice here. And we've moved back in behind this area now so that we can get into an area that is stable. And we feather wedge them uh, pieces off of them so that we can get through. overhead and every bit of this has had to come out by bucket from there all the way down a good 18 feet of solid uh, broken rock and fill there you can see our safety harness there that we use when we get into a spot where we think we might break in break through next to a tremendous boulder we call the monolith. It's about 25 feet long, 18 feet thick, and about 23 feet deep. And there's a the original entrance. That was the original entrance into Havier's Hole. Now, we've dug on down another 8 feet, and here we are. We've made another hole through, and you can see where we've uh, drilled it, and we've feather wedged and broken that rock off. Now, that's Lyle. Stockwell there, and we're pulling buckets up. We've gone down in Havier's Hole now because it's a stable area to work. And at the time you're looking, we're down probably 15 feet. And eventually, right in this hole, we go down 30 feet. We're 30 feet to the bottom. And our now down at the bottom of Havier's Hole. We're now down about 24 feet. In fact, we're down 20, 27 feet now, and we're going to start to move sideways. And we're moving over to the area where we do believe the vent, the lava vent hole at the top of the tube is. Part of the Loyal Crew, February the 4th, 1993, and it was cold. We were working in about 8 to 10 inches of snow here at this time, but it's warm down in the cave. But over the winter months, winter of 1993, we had a tremendous rain, and it, while we weren't there, it caved in the entrance, about five cubic yards of dirt came down and we had to dig that back out. This is a drill rod that we had stuck in the floor. We had to dig out. It was eight feet long. Here we are digging out the entrance.
There is a solid steel one one and a quarter inch pry bar that was laying just inside the entrance, and when it caved in, it bent that bar just like that. Shows the power of a cave-in. Luckily, there was no one there. Tom is digging out the uh, entrance. Most of our lights were taken out when the uh, ceiling fell down. Out, and we're back down in working again. That's Buck down in the bottom of Savior's Hole, still digging. There's one of our pry bars. We stuck it in the floor, and we'll show you what the bottom of Savior's Hole looks like. We're down underneath the monolith at this time. And we're going, looking up, now up to the mouth of Avier's Hole. There's the perch. And the buckets are sent up by that rope up to the perch, then handed out through the hole, and then someone takes it on out and dumps it. Things we found as we were going down in to Avier's Hole, here's a piece of stone with a ceramic-like coating on it. It's like uh, making a, uh, a cup or a sa saucer. You, uh, After you bake it, you put a coating on it and then rebake it. This is a piece of uh, rubber, of uh, foam rubber, like a piece of bathing cap or something that we found down in the bottom of the hole, which means that at some time or another that most of that hole was open. We found this at about the 22-foot level on the way down. Uh, here we are, the crew has just gotten up here, it's, it's uh, about a quarter to nine, or about a quarter after nine, and we're up here in the fog, and now we're on in the Havier's Hole, 27 feet, and we got Digger Doherty. Headed on to 060. We think we've got about maybe three, four feet to go before we break into the side of the vent. We believe the top of the vent is above us. As we pull the smoke test, the smoke is going up through the ceiling in the 060 direction. And the dirt down here is very compact, like concrete, so we're in a very stable area now. We're not going to have anything fall on us. As you can see, we've got to almost pick the things off of the ceiling. It's, it's just like concrete. A top view of the cave. This is the entrance, about six foot across by about, well, about eight foot by six foot. This is the area where the initials were carved in the wall down below, 16 and a half feet deep. This is where Leroy and Norm Lehrman had their interview. And from this point on, it has been caved in, and we've had to dig all this way. This is what we call a coffin lid. And over in this area is where we believe the top of the vent was. Now, it was very unstable in that area. We continued digging on out. And this is the other, the trench number two that we dug so we could come in from the bottom half of the uh, cave. Now, this is <clears throat> Havier's Hole. We had to come back in through this area. And down in here, we're now down 27 feet 
below the floor of the cave here, we're 67 feet below the surface. We've gone down 27 feet, and now we're going sideways out through this area on a heading of about 060, and we expect to intercept this uh, somewhere. Now I'll show you a uh, side view of the cave. Uh, here we are with a side view of the Howard Cave. This is the entrance, upper entrance, 16 and a half feet to this point. Narrow squeeze on through. Here's where the initials were. This is where Norm and Leroy were standing. And at this point on, it's all been caved in, and we've had to dig this all out by bucket. You can see it took more than 12 people in a bucket brigade all the way through and out. So we dug a new hole, we drilled through here, and dug this out so that we can now come in this way. Now the old vent used to be right at this point, but the ceiling has fallen down and covered it up at this point. We dug as far as we dared, but got to a point, if we took any more rocks out, this whole ceiling would fall down on us. So what we did is we moved back here to Havier's Hole, which you've seen, and we've gone down here 27 feet. And now we're going sideways on a heading of 060 degrees, and we expect to hit the vent on the side just about here. Now we don't know whether the vent is 2 feet wide here, 4 feet, 6 feet, or 8 feet. We do know that, according to the old stories, that within flashlight, uh, range, the uh, vent opened up to about 30 feet. So that's something we're going to have to wait and find out. Nothing inside cannot sky mountain on the shores of Clear Lake. One man has been saying there's nothing for years, but now he's been forced to stop. Here's Senator Force John Kessler explains. <laughs> This is a sacred land. Homo Indian legend tells of the gate to the upper world here. It was also Indian belief the little people lived under this mountain and may still. Indian legend. <laughs> I've, I've got books of it. That Bob Zalewski isn't looking for the little people. He wants to find the world's largest room. It's here. All the old pioneers in town, they know it's here. They, they've heard these stories for generations here. Stories like back in the late 1880s when Heck Miller and his hunting buddies found a hole in the floor of this cave. That would have been right there. A hole down which a thousand feet of weighted string was lowered, never to touch bottom. A hole into which Indians threw a notched log, only to have it found floating in Clear Lake, two miles away at the mountain's base. Zalewski and many others believe that hole is the entry to what could be one of the true wonders of the world, a huge cavern with an underground lake that may have blind fish, fish the Indians say they've caught near another cave on the shore of Clear Lake. We move anything in this hole, everything comes down on their head. But sometime after 1940, a cave-in covered that hole, and underbrush hid the cave. I spent 35 years investigating this until we finally found the cave. For the past four years, Zalewski and dozens of volunteers working weekends have searched for that hole, digging by hand to lead the way cigar smoke which was mysteriously pulled further into the cave. You're so close. Yeah, we're close. Disappointing, isn't it? <laughs> Disappointing because on this day, they're packing up, leaving, stopped, not from hard rock, 
But by this, to buy it at twice what it's worth. My knees are giving out trying to climb that. For the record, Zalewski says this is his last trip to the cave. He says he'll find another way in. I bet every dime I got or ever would have. What I've told you is here. It's here. John Kessler, News Center 4. Bob Zalewski's got some science on his side. Recent tests confirm there is something to the theory that nothing is under the mountain. Bob won't likely give up easily, though. He's already spent some $18,000 of his own money on this quest. The Northern California mountain. Could it unlock a Native American secret? The cavern, and it's located right here in Northern California. An exploration team has been atop Mount Concocti at Clear Lake for the last four years, trying to find a way into the volcanic mountain. But their work and the secrets those caverns may reveal may come to an end if some property owners have their way. Channel 3's Kimberly Plummer has the story in tonight's special assignment. Native Americans believe Mount Kanoktai is a sacred mountain. According to legend, more than 12,000 years ago, the Pomo Indians would descend deep inside the bowels of this mountain to a cavern where they would hold religious ceremonies. Legend also tells of the little people who lived inside Mount Kanoktai during the Ice Age. We got poison oak down here you got to watch out for. 73-year-old Bob Zalewski has dedicated the last 35 years of his life to exploring Mount Kanoktai and its history. What I think we're going to find is a lost city down in one of these big caverns down here that's an old people 10, 15, 20,000 years ago. That's what my dream is. I see it. Heavy door. But following that dream and unlocking the secrets of the mountain hasn't been easy. Don't touch any of the shoring. This is, this is what holds these tremendous rocks off our head here. For four years, Zalewski's been working with a team of volunteers, including a professional geologist, searching for a way in. Maybe he can push your feet. <laughs> They've dug 67 feet under the ground, looking for what they believe will be the largest underground cavern in the world, possibly a mile across and more than 2,000 feet high. I've got stories of where they threw square, four-inch square wooden blocks. They painted them red and yellow and threw them down this hole that came up in the lake. Leroy Thomas may be the last living person who says he's seen the black hole that drops into the cavern. He and his high school buddies used to come to the cave in the late 30s before the mountain and, uh, shifted and sealed the entrance. I can't remember how far through that hole that, that, that I went till the hole went straight down. And then we just dropped rocks and tried to listen to it, see if we could hear them hit. This is what Zalewski envisions. A vertical shaft at Wright's Peak dropping into a giant triangular-shaped cavern. Inside, a lake estimated to be 90 feet deep. That lake sits 300 feet above the level of Clear Lake outside the mountain. Zalewski also believes there are several other ways into the cave, including an underwater tunnel. He's even sent divers down looking for an underwater entrance and fish without eyes who've lived in darkness for millions of years. We know that the room is there. But what's going to be interesting is to find out what else is there. Possibly ancient Indian artifacts. But Zalewski and his crew may now have to start from scratch at another location on the mountain. His team is being ordered off the property where they were digging. The property owner who okayed his exploration project has passed away in the new air duct of their stuff. It hurts because I think we were pretty, very, very close to finding something. We're done. Sad day. In Lake County, Kimberly Plummer, Channel 3 Report. And Kimberly says that uh, Bob Zalewski will continue his quest to look for the cavern. He'll try and find a different property owner who will let him resume the exploration. But lawyers for Mr. Fowler emphasize this is private property, and they say the public has no access to the site.